It's good to see you this morning. As Steve said, my name's Dave. I'm the pastor here. And we're going to pray as the Lord speaks through his word. So let's pray together. Our dear, gracious and loving Heavenly Father, how we praise you for your kindness and mercies to us in the Lord Jesus. How we praise you that we can gather here together as the family of God, brought together by the Lord Jesus, worshipping, rejoicing together. And we pray that you might speak to each one of our hearts through your true and gracious word this morning. Amen. Well, I recognize that there are challenges in this passage, but um, just to get us thinking about things, I thought we'd start off with something a little more um, lighthearted, and we're going to run through the cities in the UK that, that spend the most on beauty. So I want you to have a think, the cities in the UK that spend the most on beauty. Uh, Biddenden is not on the list, by the way, uh, but it's fairly broad, okay, so it covers um, things like makeup and uh, having your hair cut, uh, your clothes, your gym membership, for, for those of us who are gym members, that sort of thing. And it's kind of spread between each household. So uh, at number five is Manchester, and they spend per household about £5,600 on beauty. Number four is Belfast, £5,900. Uh, number three is Coventry. They're very beautiful in Coventry. £6,300 per household on beauty. Uh, and they're tied with London, £6,300. And the number one city in the UK per spend on beauty is Leeds. So peop people in Leeds apparently spend uh, £7,000 a year on beauty. And, and to me, that seemed like a, a kind of monumental amount, but it was on a survey on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> uh, and the funny thing is, that was figures from a, a few years ago, so it, it has changed, obviously, since we left. Uh, <laughs> but the, the point is clear, isn't it? That, that beauty and spending on personal appearance is just a, a huge thing. And yet, this is after a a generation of Hollywood films that have told us what uh, true beauty is on the inside, simultaneously hiring the most uh, beautiful actors and actresses, animating the most beautiful characters. And we look at this and we think, well, where is beauty to be found? Is it uh, 7,000 pounds a year on hair and makeup and, and teeth whitening is very expensive in Leeds, apparently? Uh, or, or is that kind of concept nonsense and beauty is, is ridiculous uh, and it's designed to fool people who would spend that sort of money on teeth whitening? And we're going to see from this passage that beauty is good and important and beautiful, but only in the way that the Lord talks about it. And this passage reminds us that true beauty is being like Jesus. That true beauty is being like Jesus. And that's something that impacts both men and women. And maybe you're listening to this and you think, well, actually, I'm not bothered about the, the kind of Hollywood vision of beauty. And yet when we read the gospel accounts, we see, don't we, that, that Jesus was genuinely the most compelling and the most attractive and the most wonderful and the most beautiful person there has ever been. Not in terms of how we looked. We're told, aren't we, almost nothing about what he looked like, but in terms of his character. And this passage this morning, we're going to see about beauty being like Jesus. Being like Jesus. Now, you, you heard, didn't you, as, as it was read, that this passage is mainly a, addressed to wives with a smaller but crucial section also to husbands. Uh, but if you're here and you're not a wife or a, a husband, this passage speaks to you too. 
because it talks about the beauty of the life of Jesus. And we together are God's family, and, and we all play our part in supporting husbands and wives and one another. And as we've seen throughout 1 Peter, what it means to live lives of beauty in this world of different roles and functions. But maybe as we read this, maybe these verses jarred with you. And you think, well, all this talk of submission, this is, uh, it just makes the church sexist or oppressive to women or just creates a, a license for abuse. And just like we were last week, we need to be honest about this too that at times women have been abused by men in the church, and men by women, which also happens, but it's rarer. And sometimes people have tried to use the Bible to justify that, and that's awful and wrong and should never happen. And we need to be clear, don't we, that church marriages can hide the, the most awful oppression and terrible things. And that does happen even in the church. And we want to say right at the beginning, if you are here and you are concerned about abuse of you or someone that you know, or belittled or threatened by a spouse, come and talk to someone. Talk to me or a Christian friend or one of the other leaders in the church. Because it does happen, and we promise that we will take you seriously. But that is not the pattern that Peter sets out for us. That he shows us that for men and women, true beauty is being like Jesus. And was there ever anyone who treated women like the Lord Jesus? Who treated women with the utmost courtesy and respect and love? As that's what it means to follow him. But let's have a look at it then. Look down at verse 1. That's the key thing, isn't it? Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. And the key words there is in the same way. Well, you think, in what way? In the way that is like Jesus. Uh, we're part of this uh, series looking at 1 Peter, and we've seen chapter 2, verses 9 to 12, the very center of the letter, that we are called to be God's people, set apart, special, loved, and yet we live amongst the world. Let me read 2, verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And so from chapter 2, verse 13, up to the end of this section, Peter's showing us how. How do we keep our conduct honorable? How do we be a beautiful witness to God? And one of the ways that we do that is in the, the roles that we find ourselves in, we submit to those who are rightly over us. We see Peter's command to obey governments and, and rulers. And for those who are slaves, or probably in our context, the employed, to submit to their employers. And here we move to wives submitting to husbands. But when it says in the same way, it absolutely is not saying in the same way that uh, slaves submit to masters. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that wives and husbands and slaves and employees, in the same way as Christ behaved, so do we. That he is the model and motivation for our submission. That wives are called to submit to husbands because of the Lord Jesus and his example. Look down at 23 to 24 of chapter 2. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. And that is what we need to keep in mind as we go through this morning. That the Lord Jesus is our model 
and motivation for submission. And to think for him, it was not submission to, to kind and, uh, and good leadership, was it? So it was to oppression and death. And yet he did not insult or abuse or rage. He beautifully sacrificed for those who persecuted him. That for all of us, true beauty is being like Jesus. And we're going to think a bit more about that under four headings and what it means. So working through verses 1 and 2, this call to be a witness by submission. To be a witness by submission. And as we look through these verses, we see what he is saying and what he isn't saying. So he is not saying, all women submit to all men. See, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying, all wives submit to all husbands. That's not what he's saying either. He's not saying wives and husbands submit to one another. That's not what he's saying. He's saying wives submit to your own husbands. And while it applies in every marriage, he's especially thinking about marriages where the husband is not a Christian, not a believer. If any of them do not believe the word. So wives, if you are married to a husband who is not a Christian, your submission and Purity and reverence is a witness to the Lord Jesus. Reverence, not only respect to your husband, but respect and awe and fear of God. Uh, That yes, you honor your husband, but God is our ultimate master. Pure, that our behavior is always obedient to God's command. And it's no good uh, obeying or submitting to husband and, and yet not living a godly life in other ways. That's not the witness he's talking about. No, he's saying submit to your husband as part of a life that is godly and honorable and pleasing to him. And yes, at times we will fail. But what an encouragement to be like Jesus because of the way it, it demonstrates how good Jesus is. And so again, the the same for slaves that we saw that helps. Well, are there limits to this? Yeah, we are not called to submit in ways that are impure against God's rules. If if your husband tells you to rob a bank with him, uh, don't do that. Okay, that's not what he's talking about. But he's not going to do that, is he? And that was why I picked that example. That there might be one or two on unusual circumstances where we say, no, that is not pure to God. But the thrust of this passage is wherever they can, wives are called to submit to non-Christian husbands so that their godly behavior might win them over for the Lord Jesus. Well, will that always work? Is it inevitable? No. It says they may be won over. It is a hope, not a promise. Does it mean we, we, we never need to speak to husbands about Jesus? No. They're said not to obey the word. That implies that they've heard it and rejected it. The, the scenario here seems to be a wife who's a Christian, who's explained the word of God to her husband. Her husband rejects it. And rather than go on and explain it again and again and again, the wife's godly and pure Submissive behavior is a witness to her faith. That the way that she lives may may make her husband think again about the word. That he might believe it and come to faith. How much we pray that that might happen in those marriages where that's an issue. To be a witness by submission. We think, does that submission mean staying in an abusive relationship? No. No. That is not the thrust of what Peter is saying. He's saying, yes, for for wives to submit to non-Christian husbands is a great witness to Christ. He's not saying that's always easy. You think for for the Lord Jesus, submission was not always pleasant. It, It may well mean doing things you don't want to do and 
going places you don't want to go. It, it did for Sarah. But the goal is, is witness. I was reflecting on this. There's a, a helpful book that I was reading. It's uh, Walking with Domestic Abuse Sufferers. Really helpful book, just reflecting on these issues. And, uh, and the awfulness of abuse and how the church can help. And the Bible is very clear that is not acceptable. And her point is this, that submission moves into abuse when it ceases to become a witness and becomes something that is taken advantage of. And while most husbands and husbands who are not Christians would see godly submission as beautiful, a few will use it and twist it for their own ends. And it stops being a witness and starts becoming victimization. Now we can't say this is going to be easy to, to understand and work out where this lies. That sometimes wives will not get the respect and love that they deserve. And in some situations that will move into be just awful situations. That is not what Peter is encouraging. And again, I would say, if you know someone in that situation, come and talk to me. That submission is not abusive. And yet, like so many other things, it can be manipulated into abuse. Well, what then does he say about it? Look at verses 3 and 4. This call to be beautiful by submission. And look again at verse 4. Your beauty should be that of your inner self. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Which is of great worth in God's sight. You see the appeal of this? Wives making themselves look beautiful by the way that they act. Rather than a kind of extravagant measures of external beauty. And to think we are, aren't we, a culture obsessed with youth. And beauty, they, they're practically synonymous, aren't they? You know the song, you've got to keep young and beautiful. If you want to be loved, keep young and beautiful. You think, well, 100% of us are going to fail at that, aren't we? Here is a beauty that improves with age. Here is a beauty that gets better as you get older. Well, what is a, a gentle and quiet spirit? Is he saying, uh, you wives need to be like little mice. You, you never say anything. Um, perhaps you might remember, if you're over a certain age, there was a kind of a sketch show on the TV, and they had this kind of comedy of a, a set of couples, and they were sitting around the dinner table, and it all looked very lovely, and then there's a lull in the conversation, and one of the wives dares to express an opinion on the economy, and there's a shocked and, and horrified silence around the table, and the punchline is, women, know your limits. You think, is that what Peter's saying? No, that is not what Peter is saying. Because submission is the same way as Jesus. That gentle and quiet and humble is like Jesus. He is gentle in his humility. He does not insist upon his rights. He is quiet in that he doesn't complain or grumble, or seek to exert his will at, at the expense of others. He is happy to take the lesser place. He is happy to struggle himself for the sake of others. But he's not quiet in the face of injustice or sin. He is bold to speak up for others. And that's why this Behavior is a contrast to the the braided hair or the jewelry or the clothes. Because if we're not careful, they can become a way of saying, me, me, me. And we spend £7,000 a year to say that we are the most important. Uh, One of the books said it's kind of noisily assertive independence. Look at me. And how that is the opposite of the Lord Jesus, where he says, look at God. Now, it's not saying it's wrong to to have nice hair. You'll see I I spend a great deal of time on my hair. (laughs) That's not what he's saying. 
he's saying it, it is this the spirit of something that says me, me, me. The way of beauty is not outward appearance, but a godly way of life. And I was thinking a bit about what this would mean. Uh, so we've got a, a friend, we've got a single friend who's a, a missionary in, in, in an Islamic country. And in this country that she is a missionary, to be a, a Christian is to be associated with the West. And with everything that comes with that. So with loose morals and a lack of respect for family and culture. And in a response to that, our friend is very careful about how she dresses and how she acts. What time she gets in in the evening. Whether she goes out by herself with a a male friend. Not because the Bible tells you how to dress but because her behavior in that culture, her attitude and her actions, that is what makes the Lord Jesus look beautiful. That is what it looks like for moral beauty in that culture that she associates the way that she behaves with the moral beauty of the Lord Jesus. And now that would look differently in our culture, but how does the way we behave make Jesus look beautiful? And here what Peter is saying is be beautiful by submission. You'll see then, too, that that Peter gives guidance about what submission looks like. But he's not specific, is he? If you're married, in your context, it will look as unique as the, the, the unique combination of your spouse and you. But, but certain characteristics are clear, aren't they? That patiently, godly, putting your husband's needs above your own. Seeking to guide your husbands towards what is good and right. And again, those of you who are not married, that is the, the prayer for marriages. Respecting his God-given role as the husband. And how hard this is and How sometimes we look with regret on what has happened and yet how gracious is the Lord Jesus. That picture of not insisting on our own rights but speaking up for the rights of others. That doesn't mean giving up our thoughts or or wives as somehow of lesser intelligence or competence. No, it's this opposite of a desire for self-glorifying autonomy. A desire for the glory of God. And the honor of your husband as you encourage him to lead, even if he's not a believer. And then we look at verses 5 to 6. Be Sarah's children by submission. Be Sarah's children by submission. Like, like any good Bible teacher, and Peter goes straight in with his example, doesn't he? His illustration. Well, what does this mean? Why would they want to? Because of godly women like Sarah. Women who are examples of faith. What it means to to obey her husband and follow him and and stick with him and submit to his leading through thick and quite a bit of thin. Because she hoped in God more than the ups and downs of circumstance. And he chooses Sarah because through her are all people who followed God in the Old Testament. Let me read Isaiah 51, verse 2. This is written to all of God's people. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. So so just like all Christians are called to look back to to Abraham as our, our father in the faith, so Christians, and especially wives, we look back to Sarah as our example in the faith. This godly woman who trusted God and submitted to Abraham and called him Lord. That she allowed her faith to guide her through a whole range of scary and difficult situations. And continued to do good. And you think the the slightly uncomfortable bit about this is that you read about Sarah's submission in Genesis and it doesn't seem all that fun, does it? Like Abraham, she's called to leave her homeland. Like Abraham, she has to live in a tent 
for the rest of her life. Abraham twice tells her to tell people that she's his sister and not his wife. And you think her response to that was not easy. And Abraham's a believer. And the example that he uses here is a a woman who perseveres in faith, in obedience to God, in submission to her husband, because she trusts in God's promises. Be Sarah's children by submission. So Peter speaks these words to wives, and then he moves on to husbands. Christian husbands, how should you behave towards your wife? How should each one of us pray for Christian husbands? And we need to listen really carefully to this because it feels like right now there are basically two options for manhood, doesn't it? If you're a man, you've basically got two options, it feels like. So you either, you listen to Disney that says men and, men and women are basically interchangeable. And there's no difference in identity or or role or function. And they should be able to do everything exactly the same. And that's one option. Or it feels like you've got the other option of the kind of the Andrew Tates of this world. Or, Or we worry that in reading this, we'll sound like that. That we want women to be subjugated and controlled and somehow are of lesser worth. Women, know your limits. And the Bible gives us a better picture of manhood. Look at verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, in the same way as the Lord Jesus, be considerate as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect as the weaker partner, as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers, that husbands are to be loving in the face of submission. And Peter is telling us this massively important truth. What is the temptation in the response to to godly submission? It's taking advantage, isn't it? Who's going to cook my dinner? Why haven't you got it ready? No, I don't really want your opinion. No, you're called to submit. And Peter says, no, husbands are to honor their wives, to treat them with the highest respect, to give up everything, to care for them physically, mentally, spiritually, your fellow heirs in the body of Christ. Likewise, to love your wife like the Lord Jesus loved his people, to give up everything, for your wife, that in the face of godly submission or not, to lead in a way that is selfless, that values the opinions and thoughts of your wife, that reflects their equal share in God's people. Uh, for too long in, in churches and marriages, women are seen as second class, that men are more valuable or important. And Peter says, no. I was sharing a bit about our friend, the missionary. And one of her struggles is that she feels all too often in church life, people don't listen to her because she's a woman. Here is a woman who is incredibly well educated. She's got three degrees, one of her degrees in theology, but she frequently feels like she has no voice in church life because she's a woman. And you think, no, that is not what Peter is saying. That men and women are heirs together of the gift of life. That men and women's voices are needed in the church and in the home. How we long to be a church where everyone has a voice. Was Jesus less valuable because of his submission? Was Jesus less glorious because of his humility? And it may be, husbands, that we need to repent of ungodly attitudes to our wives because They've demonstrated godly submission and we've abused that. That being considerate is understanding that women are fellow heirs and partners with men. And if we get our relationships wrong, if we're selfish or arrogant or or fail to lead, it will cause a damage 
in our relationship with God. It will hinder our prayers. And it means respecting and understanding that our wives are, are weaker. You think, well, weaker in what way? Certainly are not mentally weaker, certainly not spiritually weaker. He's highlighting that wives are often physically weaker than their husbands. Their roles in society often makes them more vulnerable. More vulnerable to abuse and oppression. And husbands, we need to take extra care. That our wives are precious and and valuable. And we need to respect them and listen to them. As heirs with us of the gift of life. To be loving in the face of submission. And that's what Peter is saying, isn't it? For husbands to honor their wives. For wives to submit to their husbands. That true beauty of both is being like Jesus. And that's where this passage comes back to him, isn't it? That it revolves around him. That he was the one who was submissive, even where he was not respected. The one who accepted insult when he was put to death. The one who was the most glorious and yet also the most sacrificial. That he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. That is true submission. That is beautiful sacrifice. Delighting in the beauty of the Lord Jesus. Now look at his love. Look at what he went through that his people might be forgiven. That is what beauty is. Not 7,000 pounds of beauty treatment. But the love of a saviour who humbled himself to death on the cross for the sake of his people. That is a beautiful man worth knowing.